Welcome to Fantasy Cartography, the show where we see what maps can teach us about fantasy and what fantasy can teach us about maps. Today, we're going to look for geological accuracy on a flat world that rides on the back of a giant turtle. In my experience, a lot of fantasy maps are kind of lazy when it comes to rivers. They seem to be drawn in as an afterthought to fill the distance between the mountains and the ocean. Most maps only draw in a few really big rivers and don't bother putting in streams and tributaries, or draw a lot of roughly parallel rivers that don't interact with each other in an interesting way, or sometimes don't bother drawing rivers at all. And if you ask me, that's quite a shame. Rivers are very important to human society. They're our main source of fresh water and an easy way for agricultural societies to transport goods in bulk. Some of the most important civilizations in history define themselves by their relationships to rivers. The Nile, the Indus, the Yellow. But I don't think you're going to learn much from me lecturing fantasy cartographers about bad rivers if you don't have a baseline knowledge of what good rivers look like. So I'm going to be positive and talk about some of my favourite rivers in fantasy. Terry Pratchett's Discworld series is set on the titular flat planet, carried on the back of four elephants and a giant turtle. This is not a planet where you'd expect to find accurate geological knowledge. But the cool thing about rivers is that the way they work is governed by basic physics, stuff like gravity, friction and surface tension. If Newtonian mechanics work on your fantasy world, rivers are going to work as well. So let's take a look at the physics of how rivers work. Rivers start in high places and they always flow downhill because of gravity, finishing a body of water like a lake or an ocean. As a rule, the closer you are to the source of a river, the higher the slope of the river, and the higher the slope, the faster the river flows. So rivers flow very quickly in the mountains and very slowly across plains. Newton comes into this when we think about momentum and erosion. When a river is flowing fast, it can erode tough rocks, and the water flow can carry away very big rocks and boulders. When a river is flowing slowly, it can barely erode anything, and can only carry very small particles of mud and dirt. In short, faster rivers carry bigger rocks. I don't know if Terry Pratchett understood the physical basis of rivers, but he was phenomenally good at describing them. So I'm going to take a whirlwind tour of the Discworld's rivers, explain what kind of river Pratchett is talking about, and look at how that very simple rule creates each different type of river, starting in the mountains and finishing at the sea. We're going to begin our tour at Coombe Valley, headwaters of the Coombe River, as described in the novel Thud. Coombe Valley is a chaotic, ever-changing tumble of wide, shallow, fast-moving streams weaving in between massive banks of piled-up boulders. This is a very accurate description of a braided river. Braided rivers form at locations with a very fast but intermittent water flow. They're especially common near glaciers, where the meltwater flows much faster during summer than it does during winter. Because the river flows very quickly, it can erode large rocks, but because of the variable flow rate, it can only roll them intermittently downstream. The result is a river which constantly changes course, picking up and dropping rocks of all sizes in its wake. The chaotic nature of Coombe Valley really helps to tell the story of Thud. The valley is the site of a famous battle between dwarfs and trolls, but from the description it sounds like just about the worst possible place to assemble an army. But this highlights how incredibly strong the rivalry between dwarfs and trolls is. They hate each other so much that they'd fight each other anywhere, even in a watery hellscape. Now let's move across to the Kingdom of Lanka, a cliffside kingdom situated on the Lanka River, and the site of several Discworld books, including Weird Sisters and Lords and Ladies. The Lanka River is noted for dropping quite suddenly into a waterfall and a gorge. Gorges and waterfalls form because of a phenomenon called downcutting or incision, which simply means that the river is cutting into solid rock. Thanks to erosion, a sufficiently fast-flowing river is likely to get deeper and deeper over time. This is especially common in cases where a plateau has been pushed upwards by a geological fault. The river is higher up, so it's forced to flow faster, which means that it can cut into the plateau. 
For example, the Colorado River in Arizona probably used to be quite a slow winding river until the Colorado Plateau was uplifted about 20 million years ago, so the river cut into the plateau to form the Grand Canyon. Similarly, a waterfall forms when a geological fault breaks up the course of a river, causing a sudden drop. Waterfalls usually only exist for a few thousand years, the blink of an eye in geological terms, because the fast flowing water erodes the rock away very quickly. It's likely that Lanka Falls and Lanka Gorge will eventually undermine the entire kingdom of Lanka. Talking of depressing things in Discworld books, let's move on to Monstrous Regiment. This book is about a war between the rival nations of Borogravia and Slovenia. The official border between these nations is the Neck River, but the Neck changes course very frequently, and every time it does, Borogravia and Slovenia have a war over the new border. The Neck is probably an example of a meandering river, the most common shape that rivers take when they flow across flat areas of land. The river is not fast enough to erode at rock, but it can pick up and carry a lot of sand and dirt. What's more, whenever there's a bend in the river, the outside of the bend flows faster than the inside, meaning that the river deposits soil on the inside and erodes at the outside. This is what creates the distinctive meander shape. It's even possible for meanders to cut themselves off, creating a curved shape called an oxbow lake or billabong. As a meandering river continues to meander its way about, it gradually creates a broad valley called a floodplain. As a general rule, the longer a floodplain exists, the broader the valley is, and the wider and slower the river is. The Neck Valley is probably a fairly new and undeveloped floodplain, so the valley is very narrow, and the river flows fast and changes course often. By contrast, the Stow Plains, the biggest farming area on the Discworld where most of its large cities are located, is an extremely broad and well-developed floodplain. The rivers which make up this floodplain, most notably the River Ankh, are very slow, wide and basically set in their roots. Because they're so slow, the rivers can only carry silt and mud. After it flows through the city of ankh Morpork, the Ankh is so muddy that it barely flows at all. The books are full of jokes about how filthy the Ankh is. For example, the university rowing teams run across the surface of the river carrying their boats. This is a comedic exaggeration of how filthy the River Thames has been at some points in history, but it does fit into our rules about how a very slow river can only carry very small particles of soil. Now of course, rivers have to end somewhere, and when they do, they drop their sediment load into the lake or ocean that they're ending in. In most cases, the sediment just pours into the ocean and is swept away by the current. However, if a river mouth leads into a fairly still body of water, it's possible that the sediment load will instead build up over time, leading to the formation of the delta. The two most famous deltas in the world today are the Mississippi Delta, which empties into the Gulf of Mexico, and the Nile Delta, which empties into a quiet corner of the Mediterranean. There's only one major delta on the Discworld, which is found where the Vieux River flows into the Swamp Sea. The city of Genua, located on this delta, is basically Pratchett's fantastical combination of Disneyland and New Orleans, and the Vieux Delta pulls a lot of stereotypes from the bayous of the Mississippi Delta. It's very fertile, wild and swampy, complete with voodoo witches and zombies and alligators. It may be a little more based on stereotypes than the brilliant descriptions of Coombe Valley, but it does help to drive the story while remaining geographically accurate. In the end, a river really is a lot more than just a straight blue line that poodles towards the coast. Rivers have a lot of storytelling and world building potential and they're a very important part of a lot of human cultures. So I hope that this random collection of facts has taught you a few things about how rivers work and maybe even given you a few ideas for writing about rivers in an interesting way. That's it for this episode of Fantasy Cartography, but please stay until after the credits for the unrelated interesting fact of the day. Uh, subscribe to the channel and click the bell icon and give this video a thumbs up if you learned anything. The full script is available on fantasycartography.tumblr.com. You can ask me questions with the Tumblr Ask box or by using Facebook, Twitter or Semaphore. Questions and corrections can be emailed to fantasycartography at iinet.net.au. Until next time, may your fantasy be cartographic and your cartography be fantastic. <laughs>
Near the town of Simsport, the Mississippi River comes very close to the Atchafalaya River, which takes a much shorter route to the ocean. If it weren't for human intervention, most of the Mississippi's water would push across to the Atchafalaya, and cities like Baton Rouge and New Orleans would be left high and dry.